Hello, and welcome to this session on physical disabilities. It is my pleasure to be your host today. My name is Martina Bucal, and I am a Czech Canadian award-winning speaker and leadership development coach. I work in the realm of leadership development and lecture at a business school here in France, Lyon, where I teach a course called Visionary Leadership. There, it's my job to work with some of the best minds in the world to help them develop a sense of their own leadership and how they can change the world for the better. So it's no surprise that I, like many of the leaders and innovators we'll be talking to today, I'm really passionate about seeing positive change in this world for all through both big and small actions. Both of those are really important. As such, I could not be more honored to be here today to moderate this important session on accessibility and physical disabilities. What this session is about is really about creating a more accessible world for all, while also altering the stigma that often comes with people who are perceived to have a physical disability. And to start, where I'd really like to set the scene and set the tone is to invite the people in the audience today who are fully mobile, who have full access to all of their bodily senses, so sight, sound, touch, and so on, to consider that we are all a very privileged group. We exist in a world that is made entirely for people like us, by people like us. Here, in this type of world, we're able to function easily without obstacle and often without prejudice and do all of those things in life, big and small, that we really want to be doing. Whether that means being able to easily reach a kitchen cupboard to make breakfast in the morning, to driving a car, or to being part of a meaningful community where we feel that we truly belong completely without judgment. We have less obstacles to overcome from the onset as people who are fully able in this way. And we function in a world that to us is highly inclusive, but to many others is extremely exclusive. My hope from today's session is that we all see that an accessible and innovative world where each individual is empowered to be their best selves, to really be able to have access to every bit on its head, finding opportunity instead of challenge wherever possible and creating huge, huge leaps and advances when it comes to the theme of physical disability. We're going to start our session with a keynote speech. Now, this is a really special speech that we'll be getting from Almog Ale Raz, who is the founder of Cornet. Now, Mr. Almog Ale Raz is the co-founder and CEO of Cornet Vision. He has under his belt more than 20 years of professional experience and an extremely successful journey in the Israeli high-tech sector, managing a startup all the way to an exit and growing a global $100 million business. It's pretty significant. Five years ago, together with his friend, Dr. Lipman, a friend and a gifted ophthalmologist, they co-founded Cornet Vision, leaving prominent positions and going back to the garage with the hope of making a global impact. Indeed, that impact is now being felt in patients benefiting from their revolutionary work, which harnesses unique characteristics of microstructures of the human body to develop biomimetic implants, which mend and replace damaged tissue while mim mimicking its function. Now, I, of course, am not a medical professional or an expert in any way, so I will leave it to Mr. L.A. Raz to tell you more about his work and how it's changing the world for the better. Mr. Ali Raz, please welcome. It is fantastic to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Many of us travel or used to travel the world. Many of us travel or used to travel the world to look for the best innovations. But if you stand still and look around you, you will find that nature has an innovative approach to problem solving. That's why we chose to mimic it. My name is Almog Raz, and I'm the CEO and VP R&D of Cornet Vision. Today, I'm honored to share with you how our unique technology and implants offer novel solutions for physical disability by emulating elements of nature. Five years ago, Dr. Gilad Litvin and I established Cornet Vision 
with a very clear and precise goal, eliminating global corneal blindness. We even printed it on our back of the business cards. While some of the people we met were skeptical, I'm thrilled to say that our self-integrating artificial cornea just made history, returning sight to corneally blind patients that had no chance of seeing again. But before I share with you the details, let me tell you a little bit about our breakthrough biomimetic implants and technology. We all know that our tissue consists of cells, but have you ever put much thought into what holds them all together? The extracellular matrix or ECM built from tiny collagen fibers acts as a skeleton of our tissue. What we're able to accomplish is to fabricate and optimize a completely synthetic, non-degradable ECM-like material. When implanted, our material goes under the radar of the immune system and its structure stimulates cellular proliferation. It seamlessly bio-integrates with the surrounding tissue. We use this material to permanently attach synthetic implants to live tissue, conceal irritating implants, permanently reinforce soft tissue, and fabricate membranes. During the development of our synthetic cornea, the Cornit Capro, we realized that our exceptional material could solve many other unmet medical needs. Currently, we have four products under development, leveraging the unique capabilities of our synthetic ECM. Our IP extends to many other solutions. Two of our products are already in clinical trials with outstanding results so far. Today, I would like to focus on two of our products. One cures a blinding disease, while the other reverses corneal blindness. They both demonstrate how out-of-the-box thinking, together with bold innovation, can bring about disruptive solutions that significantly impact human lives. By the way, they both won top prizes in leading prestigious international competitions, earning us global recognition for our innovation. I will start with the Cornit Ishan, our novel and revolutionary glaucoma drainage device. To better understand the innovation of the Cornit Ishan, we need to start with the human eye, a remarkable organ. In order to maintain the transparency of the cornea and the lens, the eye constantly produces a liquid called aqueous humor that feeds the cell. It is produced behind the iris, travels through our pupil, and then it is absorbed around the cornea. Glaucoma, which is induced by high intraocular pressure, impacts the lives of approximately 80 million people globally. This condition irreversibly damages the optics nerve, gradually narrowing the patient's field of view and eventually leading to blindness. In order to avoid blindness, one must reduce the pressure in the eye. Despite the severity of this condition, none of the current treatments and surgical procedures provide long-term efficacy and predetermined pressure. Current solutions for severe glaucoma include lifelong drops, as well as incisional surgeries and shunts, also called glaucoma drainage devices. The latter are very invasive and clog at a rate of 10 to 20% a year. This area hasn't seen innovation in decades. As far as drops, patients struggle to maintain their use and comply with the prescribed regimen. The bottom line is that there is no long-term effective solution. This is where the Cornit Ishan comes into play. The Cornit Ishan is poised to replace the use of current glaucoma shunts and incisional surgeries used to treat severe glaucoma patients and provide for the first time a long-lasting cure for glaucoma, while existing shunts rely on scarring processes occurring at the outlet to control flow our inlet does this by mimicking the structure of the trabecular mesh root, which is the natural tissue around the cornea that absorbs the liquid. This innovative idea allowed us to extend the shunt by just a few millimeters and position its outlet deep in the orbit in an area that has no fat and blood vessels and is less likely to clog, and by that solve the major challenge with existing shunts. The fact that the Cornit Ishan tube is coated with a biomimetic material eliminates the need to suture tissue over it. This significantly simplifies and cuts implementation time from around 45 minutes to under 10. This is key in making it more accessible. The innovation of the Cornit Ishan is poised to extend severe glaucoma treatment to millions of peoples around the world, stopping the progression of this devastating condition. And now our flagship device, the Cornit Capro, which is already revolutionizing corneal therapy providing for the first time a reliable synthetic substitute to the human cornea. The Cornit Capro will enable corneally blind patients around the world to fully rehabilitate their vision following a simple and straightforward procedure. A little bit of a background. The cornea is the front window of the eye. It is responsible for 70% of the eye's optical power. 
Together with the lens, it focuses light on the retina, creating an image in our mind. It must be spherical and transparent for us to see. When your cornea is damaged, this is what your world looks like. There are over 20 different medical indications that damage the cornea's shape and transparency. Imagine seeing your loved ones and go about your daily lives in such a way. There are 2 million new cases of corneal blindness each year, and only a small fraction, approximately 150,000, are treated with donor tissue. This accumulates to about 10 million bilaterally blind patients, over 20 million who are unilaterally blind, close to 30 million additional patients who suffer from significant degraded or low vision and can benefit from a good and reliable solution. The challenge varies with geography. Corneal tissue supply is extremely limited and practically non-existent in many countries. In the few countries where tissue is abundant, 20% of the patients are not suitable or have failed one or more transplantations, reducing the chance of a successful subsequent implantation. The need to operate IBEX and train qualified surgeons to perform this delicate and complex procedure poses an additional challenge. Based on a recent JAMA study, there is only one cornea available for 70 needed. Corneal transplantation, also known as keratoplasty, is a procedure where a donor tissue replaces a damaged cornea. The success rate and visual acuity significantly vary between patients. Over 50% of so-called successful implantations end up with extremely distorted vision. Additional disadvantages include, include long healing time, reliance on donor tissue which can carry disease, and a long follow-up period. The rate of keratoplasty is not growing. All previous attempts to develop an artificial solution have failed to address the need. Due to low reliability and high rate of complications, these are only used as a last resort for patients who are not suitable for transplantation. Less than 1,000 devices are implanted each year. All solutions in the market today require harvested human tissue for integration and are very complex to implant and follow up. The key innovation behind the Conid Capo lies in its integration approach. We call it thinking outside the sphere. Picture yourself trying to fix a hole in a cup full of water. I'm sure you can figure out which is the simpler option, patching the cup from the inside or taping it from the outside. Surprisingly, no one thought of the latter. All previous attempts and cornea transplantation try to integrate with the native cornea, a tissue that heals very poorly. We, on the other hand, leverage our unique technology to permanently integrate our device under the conjunctiva, the white part of the eye, an area that is rich with blood vessels and heals vigorously. This innovation with integration concept provides a much stronger and reliable mechanical bond that is established within weeks and does not require extensive follow-up. It also relieves physicians from the need to delicately suture and align one soft optical tissue to another. Here is a quick animation of the implantation procedure. The device is fastened to the eye wall by pulling out the three sutures and then tying them up between the device skirt and the sclera. This step ensures centration, retention, and ease of implantation. Using a dedicated spatula called the snapper, the corneal rim, which is stained for ease of visualization, is snapped into the device's posterior undercut. The marked paracentesis lines direct the surgeon when inserting the snapper. The conjunctiva is repositioned, thus covering the skirt, and is then sutured into place using degradable sutures. Following implantation, progressive tissue integration ensues. Fibroblasts and collagen gradually colonize the integrating skirt. Full integration is achieved within weeks, permanently embedding the device within the patient's eye. With the Cronic K-Pro is superior to coronal transplantation in many aspects. Our K-Pro 7 mm aperture lens provides exceptional visual performance that is equivalent to a perfect cornea. Combining this with a simple procedure, no need for donor tissue, and a short and simple follow-up allows a solution to be truly scalable and generate a significant global impact, including in countries where corneal transplantations are non-existent. I was privileged to experience firsthand the life-changing impact of our solutions, a truly emotional moment.
כבר שנים ארוכות שג'מאל מחיפה עיוור, אבל עכשיו המצאה ישראלית חדשה עומדת להחזיר לו את מאור עיניו. מאיר מרציאנו, כתבי לענייני בריאות, ליווה אותו במעמד המרגש. אני כמעט לא רואה לחלוטין. אם יש לי ידיד, שכן שלי, דומה לך, הוא יושב עכשיו כאן, אני לא יכול לדעת מי השכן, אתה או הוא. ג'מאל פורני מחיפה נותח ארבעה ניתוחים שבהם ניסו להציל את מאור עיניו, כולם נכשלו. ג'מאל, אז אנחנו מנתחים היום את העין הימנית, נכון? נכון מאוד. שהשתל שלך הוא לגמרי לגמרי עכור. בעקבות בצקות ומחלות רקע, הקרנית של ג'מאל נפגעה והוא איבד את היכולת לראות ולהסתדר לבד. אשתי הייתה נשארת בכם והייתי מתעוור לחלוטין. לא הייתי דואג, תאמיני לי, כי היא הייתה העיניים שלי. נולד לו נכד חדש לפני חודשיים. הוא חסר, עדיין חסר את המשהו הזה, שהוא לזהות, להרגיש את זה, כי לראות בעיניים זה לא כמו רק לשמוע או להרגיש. אחרי כל ניתוח של ג'מאל, גם הסיכויים של הניתוח הבא להצליח פחתו מאוד. כל הליך רפואי חשף את העין לזיהומים נוספים והפחית את הסיכוי לשוב ולראות. העיניים האלה בדרך כלל שמגיעות לניתוחים האלה, לניתוחים של השתלות קרנית מלאכותית, הן עיניים מורכבות. אנשים מגיעים לניתוח הזה בדרך כלל עם הגב לקיר. עד היום כדי להשתיל קרנית בעינו של מטופל צריך היה להשיג קרנית מאדם אחר או להיעזר בטכנולוגיות אחרות ומסובכות. במהלך השנים האחרונות פותחה במעבדה בישראל קרנית מלאכותית שהשתלתה יכולה להתבצע בשיטות חדשניות הרבה יותר. החידוש פה הוא האפשרות לקחת משהו סינתטי לגמרי שאין עליו בכלל תאים או רקמה ולהטמיע אותו כך בין שכבות דופן עין בעצם להפוך אותו לחלק מהגוף. הפיתוח החדש הזה מאפשר לקרנית העין המלאכותית להיקלט בגוף באמצעות התאים הקיימים בעין. הפרוטזה הזו, הקרנית הזו, אתה הראשון שישתילו אותה בעין שלך. Today is the big day. We're going to implant our first ever capro in a blind human subject. ג'מאל מתכונן להיכנס לניתוח בתקווה שהפעם הוא יסתיים בהצלחה. יממה לאחר הניתוח חזרנו אליו, המתח בחדר הורגש כשהרופאים הסירו את התחבושות. אתה רואה פה את האצבעות שלי? חמש, זה זאת. בסוף. נכון, מתחת לאפס. נכון. וארבע ושתיים על יום. מהמם. קודם את החמש הוא לא היה רואה. אתה רואה? אתה רואה, באמת. כל הכבוד, וואו, מרגש. מרגש, מרגש. אחרי עשרות שנים שבהן ראייתו הלכה ונחלשה, ג'מאל חזר לראות. כמה שאתם מסמכים, אני רוצה לראות. זה אוצר שלי. אני רוצה לראות. We are now five months following the procedure. ג'מאל is extremely happy with his vision and renewed independency, with no complaints of pain or discomfort. On the top left, you can see Jamal's eye before the operation. Immediately after, the dramatic aesthetic impact was already apparent. A couple of weeks later, once the eye healed, his eye looked completely natural. Jamal's story touched many people and gave hope to millions. Opportunities to make an impact and help the disabled are everywhere. Do not be intimidated by the skeptics. Remember, experts may know a lot about the, the past, but innovators define the future. I encourage you to dream, to dare, and to make a difference. Thank you. And thank you so much for this talk, for telling us about the amazing innovations that you've created. I think the, the big thing that's coming out of this for me is just recognizing that you know, disability doesn't need to be a permanent state of being, that there are you know, ins and outs for somebody with a disability through technological and innovative things that people like you are bold enough to, you know, go out, create, pursue, and, you know, turn into action. You're really, you're changing people's lives. So thank you so much for doing what you do and sharing it with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Next in our session, we will be turning to a second part, which is a panel discussion between two very interesting innovators indeed. Both of these gentlemen in this particular case are making it possible to really think outside of the box when creating projects that are inclusive and accessible. First, we'll have Lambert Trenomat. 
the co-founder and CEO of GyroLift, which serves to make mobility equal for all. GyroLift is a universal and innovative mobility solution based on the combination of a gyropod and a stabilized modular robotic seating system. He'll explain what that means. <laughs> it was initially inspired by the concept of a Segway. And this innovative device does so much more than you would expect. I'm really excited for uh, Mr. Tremona to share that with you today. Our second speaker is Frederic Vacher. Mr. Vacher graduated as a mechanical engineer, worked for Airbus Group for five years in Japan, and then joined Dassault Systems in 1998 to lead a partnership and alliances program. Fred is now head of innovation and created the 3D Experience Lab in 2015, so it's been running for a while now. And, and it's an open innovation lab accelerating disruptive innovations that give a strong positive impact to society. Fred was also a member of the board at Cap Digital French Digital Cluster and on the advisory board at Illumens. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us here today. It is a pleasure to have you. Nice to meet you, Martina. Every, hello, everyone. Hello. So I want to start off by briefly diving into what it is that both of you do in your respective projects and really how do you see this as being, you know, majorly innovative in the space that you are in? Um, Mr. Vesche, per, uh, perhaps you can start us off. Yes, and um, globally speaking, uh, and uh, I'll share my, my screen to, uh, uh, to better illustrate what, uh, what we do. Um, With Dassault Systems, since uh, 40 years, we help the industries to uh, virtualize their uh, products. So from design, engineering, simulation, up to uh, manufacturing. And uh, we cover uh, 11 industries, so we are worldwide leader. Um, so uh, on, on most of the things you have around you are, have been uh, digitalized in 3D with, uh, with our software. So it's, uh, it's planes, civil or military, it's transportation, automotive, uh, mobility at large. Uh, it's marine, it's uh, machinery and uh, industrial equipment, high tech, home and lifestyles, up to um, life science on healthcare, which is now our uh, second biggest market. So at the really beginning, Daso Systems was um, providing software for engineers, okay, to design uh, an engineer in, in 3D. On, Two of our uh, most uh, famous brands are uh, SolidWorks and, and Katia. Uh, but since uh, two years, ten years, we heavily invested in life science uh, from product to life. So uh, first, uh, designing at the nanomolecular level in order to uh, innovate in the uh, new molecules, new materials. Uh, and it is the, the role of this uh, brand, uh, Biovia. Uh, which is now serving the pharmaceutical industries and uh, providing what we provided to the industrials, but also to the, the, the complete life cycle uh, of the of the product, life cycle management, but also to to to, to molecule. And more recently, uh, with the MediData acquisition we did, we help also for a clinical trial. So I don't know if you know, for instance, but for a COVID vaccines. 60% uh, of the clinical trials worldwide has been performed on uh, our MediData platform. So uh, the system is really uh, going from, from product to, to life in order to virtualize uh, not only product, but the, the, the people on the, on the nature. F five years ago, um, I created a 3D Experience Lab. Uh, the 3D Experience Lab initiative is an open uh, innovation laboratory to uh, accelerate uh, disruptive projects that strongly impact the society. So it was five years ago, and, uh, and now it's now the, the trend, and we've changed now summit uh, since two years, obviously, uh, the impact, the positive impact is, uh, is a topic. But five years ago, it was our main criteria. Uh, and uh, we are uh, located, as I said, everywhere around the, the, the globe. And physically speaking, we have uh, a 3D experience lab uh, in our headquarters in Paris, uh, in partnership with the local incubators ecosystem. 
like Polytechnique, for instance, in Paris. Uh, we have another one uh, in our North America headquarters in Boston, in partnership with Green Town Lab, which is a, a green tech incubator we, in partnership with the MIT. And uh, we have a third one in, in India. On uh, those uh, years, we are uh, working on uh, building a new one in Munich uh, that should open uh, end of this year and in, uh, in Shanghai. So we are really global, and uh, as the, the, the Free Experience Lab is a, in fact digital and virtual incubator, we can uh, accelerate innovation wherever it is, not only in our four labs, but those four labs are platforms in order to cover with partners the, 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 the complete uh, planet. And as I said, uh, we have as a main criteria uh, the impact. Uh, we have uh, having three main themes, city, life, on lifestyle. And as we are talking about disabilities today, uh, I would like to give you some uh, few examples of uh, projects that uh, we are accelerating into this, uh, this field. Uh, one of them is an Indian project uh, called INALI. Uh, the objective is to uh, design and engineer very affordable bionic arms for uh, uh, people losing their, uh, their hands. And this is now possible thanks to uh, 3D printing, thanks to the cloud, so that uh, this uh, young team is capable to uh, generate the design of the hand of the person. So it's personal, personalized, you know, from a scan, they get the exact dimension, and they will generate, as you can see here on the screen, the design uh, on demand. And then they are uh, 3D printing on demand, the, the prosthesis, uh, and, and the 3D printing process makes it very, uh, very affordable. The second one is a, is a French one. This time it is for uh, autism people, for children. Uh, so it's a smart robot that uh, helps children to uh, interact with the uh, environment, with people, and to uh, be more social. So it's a very uh, um, friendly smart robot whereby the, 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 autist, the, the autist child could, uh, could, could, could play on the on the evaluate and again the, the the virtualization of the of the product is key and one of the main um, support we provided to this uh, startup was the help in the industrialization you know for a startup it's usually difficult to go from the prototype to the to the the series the industrialization because you need to think about manufacturability on all those constraints. And it was one of the main, uh, main um, support we provided them. Uh, another one is a uh, Splash Elec. Uh, they are uh, imaging and they, their innovation is a, a boat accessible for uh, uh, physically handicapped people. So to, uh, for, uh, for bringing uh, sailing more accessible to, uh, to people uh, being in, in wheelchair. And it's under development and uh, go doing good, uh, good progress. So it means that uh, a way for, uh, for those people to access the boat and then to pilot the boat. So there is, you know, uh, IoT device to connect the boat to the, um, to the coast and help also uh, in, the, in the guidance. Uh, a last project before uh, talking about uh, Girolift is a magic wheelchair. Uh, so it's another category of project we uh, accelerate. The, the first one were uh, startups uh, with a, a startup accelerator, so that uh, with other partners, we, uh, in a collaboration mode, help them to, to make it happen. Um, second category of project, as I said, is a community project. So it's an online community platform whereby individuals can group and work together to establish uh, a common project. This is the case for a magic wheelchair, which is also a, an association. I don't know if you heard about this association. And here the objective is, uh, this is their, their logo, is to transform the, the dream of an handicapped children uh, in, into reality. Uh, and what they do, uh, so they are asking a children what is his dream, you know, by discussing with, uh, with him. On a group of person, passionate people, designers, engineers, are working around the, the 3D model of the wheelchair in order to design and create a costume 
uh, that will transform the wheelchair into the dream of the children. Like this one, for instance, the, the monster truck, you see the, the wheelchair of the, of the children, and on top of it, taking into consideration all the security aspect, they created what they call a, a costume. Uh, and uh, the objective, obviously, is to give some smiles to, uh, to the, those uh, children. And here is, is, is the team of those people. So um, those people are depending on the project uh, everywhere on the globe, grouping in order to, uh, to, uh, to, to create these, um, these costumes. On, on Gerolift, uh, this is for uh, uh, physical uh, handicap. So uh, uh, the objective is to revolutionize the, the wheelchair with a, a, a new design, um, uh, a smart wheelchair that will um, have a standing uh, position for, uh, for those people to, uh, to not only uh, uh, work seated, but also uh, stand up uh, while they are discussing with, with you. And uh, here, uh, uh, we worked a lot with, uh, with uh, Lambert uh, on the design and engineering of this uh, wheelchair, as you can see uh, on my screen. This is the, the, the 3D uh, model of the wheelchair. And if I uh, explode uh, the, the product, you will understand that there is a lot of components inside. And uh, here, the objective uh, with uh, Girolift, the startup, was to uh, work with them collaboratively uh, to help them to, uh, to industrialize their, uh, their ID. I, I don't know about the two of you, but on my side, I can't see the visual, unfortunately. Lambert, yeah. could you see the, the visual? No, uh, at, the, uh, at the end, I've never, I've not seen the visual. Okay. No, there have been no visuals. Um, just here. I, I was going to suggest, I know that Mr. Tsukanola is potentially sitting somewhere near a gyro lift. Is that possible? I'm not seated on the gyro lift, but there is a, just a gyro lift here. Maybe we can so see So the best is here. to see it in action, right, uh, Lambert? Yeah, yes. There is like... <laughs> Incredible. We talk about there is a, a gyro pod, like personal transport or like Segway basically mm -hmm. for people who know Segway, and we develop a robotic module on it to allow any type of users to move as well, sit as standing. There is like, I can show you, like a verticalization solution. This is the key innovation uh, so that uh, people can stand up on the yeah, and the wall to, uh, I would say, over -persons. user can be stand yeah to have access to objects to be in front of a uh, valid users there is like many application of it that's quite incredible and i think i, re I recall from speaking with you mrs kanona that um there's there are actual several components to the gyro lift that are innovative and interesting uh, one of the things that you said to me that was really memorable is that people have been looking at it and even somebody who does not have a physical disability can look at it and be really impressed and want to use the gyro lift. Can you tell us yes. a little bit more about why that's important, why that's special? The, the stigma of the handicap is very important because moreover, when it's a, a, a physical uh, handicap, because you see it firstly, it's the first thing you see on people. When he's seated on a wheelchair, you see the wheelchair first. You says, okay, before to know the user, his name, etc., you know that he's on the wheelchair and is handicapped. It's like write it on his front. So it's very important for uh, users to be seated on something that not stigmatization like a, a medical device. Uh, we worked on Gerolift on the design, on the, um, something new, only two wheels, something different. When you see a wheelchair from just a year after World War One, and a wheelchair right now, it's the same. That doesn't have evolved. And we grown, we make like automotive, we, we, we launch, uh, we go on the moon, and the wheelchair still be the same. Why? We need to work on it and, uh, and uh, on this destigmatization of the medical device. It's very important for us. Definitely. And it's, um, 
it, it shows even in the way that you know the design is created it's made for accessibility for all it goes beyond you know helping people with disabilities which is amazing i think you were telling me some of the applications are you know in a warehouse setting or where people are constantly seated uh, it's actually better to be in an upright position and then here the gyro lift can actually support that as well which is incredible one last thing that i'm going to wrap up on here briefly um, in our conversation earlier, you mentioned to me as well a piece, as you said, right, the wheelchair has not changed mm. since its inception. It really looks the same, very much yes. so today as it did when it first started. And you gave me a quote, I don't know if you remember, about what people should be asking themselves when they're building mm. something. Do you think you could share that with the audience? <laughs> for for innovation, the quote like yeah. like yeah, it's um, it's something important in GeoLift for any aspects of the the the, the company, the startup, is when someone asks you why you making this, if your only answer is I've always make it like this, it's the wrong answer. You need to be innovative. You need to put innovation everywhere, and if you make it like this since day one there is a problem because you don't put innovation and new id and new conception on your work even if you are like commercial or manager or engineer you need to re rethink and change the way to think about your works too yeah and i think that that is an amazing thing that you know both of you in your work are doing you're looking at the realm of possibility and your allowing through digitization, for example, to visualize possibilities, right, for deeply impactful projects. Here you are creating things that really are changing the world for the better. We've got about one minute left. I would love to take it to you, Mr. Veshe. Is there a dream, a hope, or a call to action that you have for this space, this, this sphere of innovation around, you know, physical disability? What would you like to see? Well, you know, we are um, supporting all sorts of uh, disruptive projects and for disabilities, uh, I strongly believe that uh, one day um, disabled persons would be uh, announced in a way that they will perform probably better than uh, uh, someone uh, having a, a normal life. Uh, if we take prothesis, for instance, more and more, you know, those prothesis are uh, being uh, personalized you know so that it fits the exact morphology of the of the person and uh, with uh, new materials with um, iot's it will probably give them some more power than uh, uh, without the prosthesis and uh, for uh, for mobility it's the same you know uh, if we're taking the gyro lift um, it's it's uh, also val valuable for uh, someone uh, um, having no handicap if we extend to exoskeleton for instance one day it will help you to run faster, to uh, take bigger loads uh, without breaking your, your back. So uh, this, is, this is really my, my dream, is to uh, have those uh, uh, prothesis or extension for disabled person, enhancing the person so that she, she feel, you know, more than, uh, more than normal <laughs> in a way. <laughs> Superhuman even. <laughs> Yes. Thank you so, so much, gentlemen, for joining us today and telling us about the incredible work that you're doing. I think what I'm really taking away from this session is that, you know, there are so many more opportunities than there are limitations in this space if you just have an eye to really look for it. There is always an opportunity to create a more innovative, more accessible, more inclusive space. It's just about really turning our minds to seeing where and how can we make that happen and going after it. Exactly. You, you, you. Usually you have your own limits. And uh, at the system, we are very interesting to, uh, to uh, uh, hear even crazy projects. So if you have uh, <laughs> candidates uh, looking at us, startups, entrepreneurs, please uh, join us for the experiencelab.com, 3 experiencelab.com, uh, so that we can enter in contact and uh, see how we can help you. Perfect. Thank you so much for that invitation. And again, thank you both for being here today. This has been a really enriching session. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Very thank much. you, Martina. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Lambert. Bye. -bye. Bye.
So for the last part of our session here today, we're in for a real treat. Our session actually isn't live. This is coming from a pre-recording. And the reason why is because our last speaker is David Smetanin. David Smetanin is a nine-time Paralympic medal winner, a very busy man who is currently in the midst of practicing for the Tokyo Olympics. So no small deal to say the least. I had the chance to have a more intimate style fireside chat with him yesterday. And I believe the Change Now team will now be sharing with that with all of you. So please enjoy. the honor to have an intimate fireside style chat with a nine-time Paralympic medalist and candidate for the election of flag bearer for the French National Paralympic Delegation in Tokyo. He is an athlete, a very impressive one at that, having won all of nine Paralympic medals as well as several European and world championships. He is not only an impressive athlete, but an incredible professional. And he has somehow managed to take time out of his extremely busy schedule <laughs> to speak to us today. His name is David Smetanin. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. It is such a pleasure to have you here. My pleasure, Martina. Thank you for this introduction. I'm happy to be here with you today. It's, um, I was just telling our audience that you have a pretty impressive schedule and you are in the midst of training right now, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah that's right. We just came back from the European Championship. Uh, it was in Madeira in, in Portugal. And we arrived uh, last Sunday for a week of uh, training with the national team uh, because we have also the national, the national yeah, um, championship this weekend, starting tomorrow morning. So I'll be racing tomorrow, my first uh, race, 9.35 exactly, uh, with a busy schedule. But it's uh, very important. It's the last uh, road to qualify to Tokyo, uh, which will be my fifth Paralympic Games. So I don't know for me, of course. <laughs> yeah, and tell the audience, because I mean, I know this because I researched you extensively, but our audience might not know yet. What is your sport of choice? I'm actually what we call a para swimmer. Uh, I've been uh, swimming before an accident, but I'm a Paralympian in swimming. Okay, and I, I'd love to hear, and I'm sure our audience would love to hear a little bit about your journey. So, you know, everyone has their own story from childhood to who they've become today. You've clearly become, you know, someone who's, whose name is, is well known and clearly associated with, you know, extreme talent in the sports world. Tell us, how did you go from, you know, itty bitty David to the David that you are today? Uh, yeah, you're right. It's, uh, it's a long journey. I've been studying uh, sports like a kid and uh, wishing to be a part of this amazing movement, the Olympic Games. And uh, fortunately, because of a car accident in 1995, the second of September, I uh, had a real stop in my career. But have at the same time as another opportunity to be back in that level with the Paralympic movement. So it's what I've been trying to do. And, uh, and when you have this chance, like a leash to back to normal life and uh, uh, like brings you to what you always expect it to be. Uh, I'm talking about the games in general. Um, you always try to think what is positive and what is not. And uh, well, my question was, what I'm going to do right now? Uh, what is the next step to be uh, at that level? And is, of course, back in training. So I started slowly and uh, training again and uh, looking forward to be a pro-Olympian instead of being an Olympian. 
incredible. It's um, it's clear that you're you're somebody who has a lot of resilience, and I would imagine a lot of confidence and audacity to sort of to stay on such a competitive track as as well, right? I mean, there is no lack of competition in the world that you exist in. Um, that's right. It's helped me a lot to uh, this resilience to jump in another life. I mean, the second life I could might say I could have, thanks to sport and thanks to swimming. But um, just taking the um, opportunity to be back uh, in that level of swimming, but also to show the world what we could achieve and what we could do as a Paralympian, as people with a disability. And it's not because we had like a drama in our life that the life stopped. I mean, it's just another opportunity to, um, well, let's say, jump to another career, jump to another life and uh, uh, have the same expression, the same feeling, the same wishes. Uh, which was be a one one day, hopefully, obviously one day uh, a Paralympian in a, on the podium. So I've been working hard for that a lot. Um, nearly 5,000 kilometers in uh, 20 years of uh, a sports career. And uh, this dream happened in 2008 uh, in the Games of Beijing, where I came back uh, from China um, with two gold medal and two silver medal. So... Um, yeah, it require a lot of um, 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 determination. It require a lot of uh, strength, passion as well. But um, it's the way we want to leave sports, so that's nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'd be I'd be curious to know because, you know, I, I genuinely believe in the resilience of the human spirit and the fact that all of us have the ability to kind of tap into that potential. Sometimes it takes something external to sort of force us into a circumstance where we have to you know, discover our own strengths and our, and our own resilience. I know that for you, I believe you were, you, uh, how old were you? I think you were 21 years old when you were in a car accident that changed your life, right? Mm -hmm. And I, w I would imagine that that for you, um, actually, you tell me, was that a challenging time for you? And how did you overcome that initial stage of transition? Obviously, it's a big change in your life. It was when you just uh, suddenly jump into a, like a drama like this, a car accident, and you don't have any idea about what disability is. You don't have any idea about what you're going to do the next day, what we'll be able to do, I mean, physically and mentally. Um, mm. Yeah, it required a lot of uh, resilience and strength, but thanks God. I mean, I had my family around me. I had a lot of people who supported me. I had a lot of people who just uh, believe in me and say, well, we totally understand that it's uh, new changes and, and big changes for you, but life is not over. You have another chance to do something better. You have all you need to for um, for moving forward to something better. And uh, it's up to you to do these changes. It's up to you to accept the situation and it's up to you to accept to work hard to be back in this uh, new life and uh, showing yourself first that you can do things as a lot of people should say, well, he has a disability now. He is not able to do anything. I mean, it's the perception that sometimes people, uh, I must say, have when they look at the handicap, the disability about people. But yeah, I have this chance, once again, to have people around me. And uh, um, there's an expression I like to say is, if success, uh, if, if if the um, self-confidence is, is about success, I mean, it's up to you to train, it's up to you to get prepared for that and to uh, do all you can, I mean, all the efforts you need to, all the training you need to, if you want to be back in this uh, level and show everyone that everything is possible. But um, yeah, the environment was very important for me. What we call entourage was really uh, exceptional and uh, it's really helped me a lot to, to yeah, to, um, change my life and uh, and accept the situation uh, and 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 um, and thinking I could do um, more than I thought. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So what I hear in there is that you know your mentality changed. You leaned into community. You found your own resilience, or rediscovered maybe even your own resilience and how you could overcome this big shift. And at once, I also hear you saying something that I know is, you know, echoed with our other speakers, that there is this certain stigma or a perception around how people 
treat you or how people see you as somebody with a disability. What was that like for you? And how did you, how did you make your way through that? Or how have you been making your way through that? Is it, is it part of your, your journey? And what does that mean for you? There's one thing you said is very important for me. Um, when we talk about people with disability, we are talking first about people and accept this significant disability, significant point. Um, it doesn't say you cannot do anything. You are like a human, like everyone, and it's about you and you only. But you're right. I had like a wall in front of me and nobody told me the way to jump up the wall or just to go around this wall. But um, it took time. I mean, the time is important in that situation. And uh, but once you know how to, yeah, to, to to do things that you will build, you'll be able to do things again. And you'll be able to maybe break this wall or jump into that wall. Um, it gives you more power. It gives you more um, um, self confidence. It gives you more more than everyone because you're coming from so far, and then you suddenly discover that everything is possible. So. Um, there was a lot of try. Sometimes it works, sometimes no. And uh, uh, when you try again and again and again, finally you discover that things are possible and you, you succeed. So that's nice. Yeah, and a you've been succeeding. To... Sorry? I know, go ahead. Sorry, I cut you off. A, a nice way uh, also to myself to understand that, that I was able to do a, a lot of things, a million of things. And I've, di and I've been discovering this uh, because of probably these accidents, because of the car accidents. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting too to see that you know you've you've come this way. You you clearly you know are an example of so much strength and resolve, and you're doing everything that you do, you know, without putting pressure on you before a you know big competition. But you've got a lot of eyes on you while you're doing all of this, right? You know, you're not doing this in isolation. It's not just you in the swimming pool. There is an audience witnessing you you know, really excelling in your sports and showing what excellence can look like. I feel that that must be so inspiring so for so many people around the world to, to be able to witness you in your strength. And I wonder if you have a message for, you know, for young people, for anybody who has these aspirations to be in an athletic space or to be in an, the professional space that you're in, in the way that you do it. What would you tell somebody who maybe is in that place that you were, you know, at the beginning where you felt maybe different, maybe, you know, that you were looked upon differently? Is there, is there a nugget that you could share? There's a million of things I could share in that perspective. I mean, <laughs> it's the way of success, the things you are dreaming about. I mean, when you're talking about the games, it's like highlighting your eyes and it's always something that I've been working for so of course uh it was the first step to say well you want to do something right you want to be at that level you want to be at the games it's up to you to work it's up to you to train very hard for that because nobody will push you for this and nobody will train and, and swim instead of you so of course there's real importance but um i always say something if you don't dream a little bit you don't have the impression of living you need to discover this in, in your life no matter you have a to struggle other things or you really need to think that dreaming is the part of the way for succeeding in things and if you want to succeed you need to train very hard sometimes like to sleep sometimes uh, being able to do what you need to eat because healthy is very important nutrition is very important um training of course but yeah dreaming is one side and then doing all you can to achieve this dream and this goal is the other side. So it's about encouraging people to believe in themselves, of course, but also just to accept or accepting a little bit, sorry, uh, accepting this part of the dream in your life, in your journey. And it's probably what will boost you to the next step. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, I think that that's a really beautiful space to wrap up on, David, because what you're saying really ties into what we've been talking uh, about today in a great way. And that really, it's amazing to have a dream. You know, we, we all 
Every single speaker that we have here today has a dream of innovation, of creating a more just and inclusive society, of doing these amazing things to make the world a better place. And we cannot do that unless we're really taking strong actions. And sometimes that's going to take bravery. Sometimes it's going to take confidence. Sometimes it's going to take second guessing yourself and not being sure if you'll succeed. But at the end of the day, it's such a worthy, worthy effort. And you certainly are an amazing example of that in everything that you have achieved up until now and going forward. <laughs> We, we, we will have we will have a lot of uh, Paralympic and Olympic champion in every corner of black streets and, and cities. But of course, it requires a little bit more. But um, dreaming is really the first step. I mean, you have to accept this. People think that it's not for me. Everyone said, I will not achieve this. I will not be able to succeed in this. I mean, it's not, it's not for me. So why? I mean, are we living? We are living to achieve dreams, to make changes, to have the possibility to do changes. And... Uh, the, the perception of the Paralympian is this one, is to say, well, thanks to sports, we can show the people that despite disability, we can do a lot of things. We can achieve performances. And this is what the world is is, 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 uh, um, um, sorry, is uh, expecting today. So yeah, that's very important. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a real great call to, to excellence, regardless of your circumstance, right? How do you dream big? step up and into that, put all these things into action and change your life. And then maybe, maybe inspire a few other people along the way like you to, uh, to, to get out there and do the same. You need to try if you want to see if it's possible or not. If you don't like look around and say, I will try despite every people around me saying, no, it's not for your things. I mean, you need to stay focused on it. You need to stay positive and say, well, I'll try. If you don't try, at least it never happened. It's not possible. Yeah, yeah. And I hear in that too that you, like I think many other people we've seen on the stage today as well, you've got an eye for opportunity, which is different than looking for the difficulties or the challenges, right? It's There is a piece about training your mind to look at the right things and to focus on them sometimes and lean into that space, the space of possibility. That's where, that's where growth and innovation and all of this good stuff happens. Yeah. That's right, and especially for new generation. If you stop the youth, who will do the next changes? Who will do an open future? I mean, nobody. So we, we, need, we need really to have them in that situation. We need to help them to boost their life and say, well, you're the next generation. We need you as this, and, and, and in, this, in this position, sorry, we need you in this position. We need you to um, and try because we will not be able to do this again. So yeah, it's really important. Beautiful. David, I want to thank you so, so much for sharing your words of inspiration, for sharing your story today, for being here with us, for taking time out of your extremely busy training schedule, knowing that you're, you know, leading up to some serious competitions, just from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. And I'm so glad that we could have you here today. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's nice. Thank you. Take care. Once again, I just really want to, uh, to thank David Smetanin and all of the speakers that were here with us today for sharing their inspiring stories, their innovations, and for helping us shift our perspectives as well about physical disabilities and how we see them, how we speak about them, and how we innovate to make sure that we can create a world that is more accessible and more enjoyable for everyone. I hope that you will take these inspiring talks and, you know, really brave them in and make some changes on your side, whatever that means for you, big or small, even just a small shift in mindset or perception goes a long way when it's amplified by a lot of people. So I leave you on that invitation today. Please take it with, take it with you, run with it. And I will look forward to seeing you hopefully in person next year at Change Now, where we will hear so much more and stay in touch with all of the global innovations that are making this world so much better. Thank you and take care.